Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. Look at this. You've probably seen something like it before. It's just regular musical notation. We've talked about how it works already, but today I'd like to look at why it works. That is, how did we get here? How did these dots and squiggles come to represent this? Well, to answer that, we're gonna have to go back in time. Like, way back. Western notation can trace its roots back to roughly the 9th century when music began to be written down with what are called neumes, a word I am very excited that I get to say a bunch of times. The first neumes worked something like this. You'd write out your lyrics, then you'd put a mark over each syllable that represents how the melody moves there. It's a fairly crude approach. They don't even tell you about the relative pitches of the syllables, just how each one was ornamented. In order to understand why this was good enough, though, there's a couple things you need to know about the music of the time. First of all, it was primarily an oral tradition. Most people couldn't read. You learn songs by ear. The point of neumes, then, wasn't so much to communicate new ideas as it was to help you remember the details of songs you already knew. The other important point is that this was used mostly for sacred chants, so the syllables, not the notes, were the most important part. It seems weird to us now, but they just had different priorities and their system reflected it. Over time, though, it became clear that encoding some pitch information would probably be beneficial, which led to the invention of heightened neumes. Here you do the same thing, but you position the symbols to show the relative starting notes. This is still very basic, and it doesn't give you exact intervals or anything, but we're beginning to see the echoes of real notation. The next step, then, was to add a line. This gave you some absolute reference point against which the notes could be compared. This line usually represented the position of either F or C. That's a little misleading, though. Absolute pitch wasn't considered all that important, so the letter names moved around depending on the key. More accurately, the line represented either the middle or the end of the scale. Early notation often colored the line to show which note it was, with red for F and yellow for C. Later, this would change to just writing the note name on the line for added clarity. With this, we could start writing a full melody down, but with only one line to compare against, it still offered a little too much ambiguity. And then came Guido of Arezzo, who popularized the first real staff. Unlike modern staves, Guido's used only four lines and had no standardized pitches. You would just mark which of the lines was F or C and be good to go. But despite all that, it was still a system of musical notation that required no guesswork, no assumption, and most importantly, no learning by ear. Musical ideas could, for the first time, be transmitted without the aid of sound, simply with a few scratches on a piece of paper. Well... Almost. Guido's staff told you all about pitch, but it contained no clear indications of rhythm. The first real innovations on that front are often attributed to the composers Leonine and Paratine, who developed what are called rhythmic modes. These were predefined patterns that notes could fall into, much like metrical feet in poetry, which we've covered before. A note's length was determined by where it fell in one of these patterns. At roughly the same time, square note heads began to appear, marking clear locations for the various neumes. These note heads conveyed melodic information, taking various shapes depending on the the ornamentation of the phrase. The idea of using them to mark rhythmic information came later in the 13th century from Franco of Cologne. His symbols were imprecise by modern standards, but they were still governed by well-defined rules vastly expanding the options for conveying rhythm. They were even further developed during the Ars Nova period, which featured the addition of more note values, letting us write more complex rhythms, and a push towards specificness and clarity in notation, making the rules for reading rhythms simpler and easier to follow. From here, we're almost done. A few small changes exist. The staff got a fifth line our note heads changed from squares to circles, we added dotted notes to clarify their meanings in the flag and beam system to show arbitrarily small rhythmic values, and we picked up some new tricks like clefts, key signatures, and bar lines. The rise of modern tuning introduced a need to represent sharps and flats, so we added accidentals. New developments in music keep forcing us to devise new techniques for notating them, but the ideas of the Ars Nova movement are still alive and well today. We're still pretty much living in their world, just a little bit fancier. If you want more details, there's some links in the description to a few papers that dive further into a lot of these areas. We're gonna take the next few weeks off for the holidays, but we'll be back with new videos in January. Until then, thanks for watching. If you want to help make these videos possible, please consider supporting 12 Tone on Patreon. You can also join our mailing list for scans of all our episodes. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and keep on rocking.